Good evening to each and every one of you and welcome to Greater Destiny Church in Tacoma, Washington, where we are transforming lives through purposeful ministry. We are a ministry led by love, living in power, and uplifted in praise. I am Pastor C. Ivan Johnson, and I am so excited and delighted and just enthusiastically exuberant to have you tuned in with us tonight for Wednesday Night Refuel. The Bible declares that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And during this time, during this season of pandemic, we certainly need a preceding word for the people of God to live thereby and to grow thereby. So if you would just do me a favor, I want you to share this broadcast with everyone on your social media platforms and let them know that it is time for Wednesday night refuel to learn of his word to be charged in his word and to grow in his word we have been in a season of stillness as I've said so often I'm going to continue to say it that we are not in a season of isolation but we are in a season of cultivation and so during this season of cultivation Continue to posture and, your, and position yourself for God to do whatever it is that he desires to do in you. The, the word of the Lord declares, psalmist, the psalmist David declared in Psalm 46 and verse 10, to be still and know that I am God and that I will be exalted among the heathen and I will be exalted in the earth. Let us continue during the season of stillness to know that he is God. Let us not forget of his power, his authority, and let's not forget that he is the God who is able to do all things but fail. And so it is my prayer that during this time of stillness, during this season of cultivation, that you are getting to know the Lord in a more intimate way, that you are allowing him to speak to you, that you are allowing him to pour into you, that you are allowing him to process you. Because on the other side of the victory of this pandemic, and you say, well, pastor, how can you say that there's victory in this pandemic? Well, understand this, that God is yet getting the glory. The very mere fact that you're alive, God is yet getting the glory. The very fact that you have all of your needs supplied is God yet getting the glory out of your life. And so on the other side of this victory, hallelujah, we're going to come out stronger. We're going to come out wiser. We're going to come out better. We're going to come out greater. We're going to come out as our best version of ourselves as a result of what God has done in our lives. So go ahead and share this broadcast. Tell everyone that you know that Wednesday night refuel at Greater Destiny Church is happening right here, right now. Let's go before the Lord with a uh, word of prayer. Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we come before you this night. We thank you because your word declares in everything to give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. And so because we know that you are perfecting those things that concerneth us, we give you thanks. We thank you for what you have done. We thank you for what you are doing, and we thank you for what you are going to do. Oh, we give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Now, Father, as we uh, gather ourselves together for this season, this time of Wednesday Night Refuel, we ask that you would open up the ears of your people to hear, that you open up the hearts of your people to receive the word in which you desire to release on this evening. We thank you and we praise you for your word. For your word is a light unto our feet and it is a lamp unto our pathway. And so we are thankful to you for this time of guidance, this time of illumination and revelation through your word. And we will trust in you with all of our hearts and lead not to our own understanding. For in all thy ways, if we acknowledge you, you will direct our paths. In the name of the Lord Jesus, who is the Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. Once again, I want to welcome you here to Greater Destiny Church, where we are transforming lives through purposeful ministry. We are a church led by love, living in power, and uplifted in praise. And this is Wednesday Night Refuel. I'm Pastor C. Ivan Johnson, and we have just started a new series titled The Principles of Kingdom Dominion. The Principles of Kingdom Dominion. I need you to text that. I need you to type that right where you are right now. The Principles of Kingdom Dominion. And we are going to move into the second principle, but let's just do a quick review of what we talked about last week, uh, the principles of kingdom dominion. The first 
principle of kingdom dominion that we have talked about is influence. It is so important that during this time that we do not allow ourselves to forget who we are in Jesus Christ. Yes, we are living in perilous times and there is so much happening all around us, but we cannot forget our kingdom identity. And you ought to type that, I have a kingdom identity. Jesus declared in Matthew chapter 18 that my kingdom is not of this world, but my kingdom is of above. And so because we are not uh, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. We operate in a different system, which gives us a different identity. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 declares, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you would show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. We have been given a kingdom identity, and as we have been made in his image and in his likeness, the very first assignment that God gave to mankind is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and that assignment is dominion. I want to read it for you in the Amplified Version, just a short review. For those of you who missed it last week, go back and uh, watch last week, Wednesday, and you'll be able to catch up to where we are. Genesis chapter 1, and the Amplified Version declares, Then God said, Let us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man in our image according to our likeness, not physical, but a spiritual personality and moral likeness, and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, and over the entire earth, and over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. Now, this word dominion in the Amplified Version is also translated as um, authority. And so authority and dominion are used interchangeably. And so the very first assignment that God gave to mankind, he gave us a domain and he gave us dominion to dominate in the earth realm. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, this dominion was compromised, but we thank God for the full restoration thereof when Jesus Christ gave up himself as a living sacrifice. And so because Jesus being crucified on the cross and being raised raised from the dead to fully restore the dominion of man on the earth. Jesus was resurrected from the dead and he declared in Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 and Jesus came and spake unto them all power not some power, not a little power, not a fraction of power, not half power, but I want you to type all power. I want you to text all power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. This is the same resurrection power that Jesus has imparted to us that we may have dominion in the earth realm. And so last week we talked about that this dominion comes with influence and that it is God's desire that we have influence in the earth realm. That we not just have influence within the four walls of the church, but that we go out into the world and that we emphasize infiltrate the marketplace with the counterculture of the kingdom. He said, it is my desire that you would have influence in the seven societal systems of the earth. Uh, have dominion and have influence in the areas of family, business, finances, entertainment and arts, the media, uh, economics, the government, and education. He wants us to have dominion in these areas. And not only does he want us to have dominion over, but he wants us to have influence within. And so this is why we need the people of God to not be idle in this season. Because when we come out of this pandemic, there should be some new business owners. There should be some knowledge of witty inventions. He said, I give you the power to get wealth. Somebody is at home sitting on a multi-million dollar idea. Somebody at home is sitting on an invention that could change the trajectory of your life forever. What are you sitting on that God has given you the dominion to have influence not only over, but have influence within? And so I want to encourage you to start making out your business plans now. Start writing out details for the next five years. You want to open up a barbershop. You want to open up a beauty shop. 
You want to open up a community garden. You may have an idea for a community program, hallelujah, that would benefit single mothers or that would benefit uh, delinquent young men. You don't know what God has given you until you sit down and you really take time to write it out. Whatever God has given you, yes, it will always start with a thought, but a thought will always remain a thought until you write it down and work it out. My God, a thought will always remain a thought until you write it down and then work it out. Uh, he told the prophet Abeka, uh, he said, write the vision and make it plain. And when you write it down, it may not happen immediately, Though it tarry, wait for it. It shall speak, it will not lie, because the vision is for an appointed time. So business owner, author, public speaker, educator, finance guru, whoever I'm talking to, commentator, publisher, blogger, TV personality, whoever I'm talking to, it's time for you to rise to the occasion to take dominion and to operate in the principle of dominion, which is influence. And so tonight we are going to talk about the second principle of dominion, spiritual authority. The second principle of dominion, spiritual authority. What is spiritual authority? Simply put, spiritual authority is divine delegated authority to act on God's behalf in the earth. Divine delegated authority to act on God's behalf in the earth. Think about it like this. Police officers and those that work in law enforcement, they have been given delegated authority to act on the behalf of the law in our city, in our state. And they have been given a badge to certify that they have been authorized. Well, can I tell you, people of the Most High God, that when we think about spiritual authority, God has deputized, God has authorized, God has caused the enemy to be relegated from the heavens to the pits of hell, and he has delegated us to have authority to act on God's behalf in the earth realm, to be his representatives. Oh my God. The function of spiritual authority is only legitimate under the ruling lordship of Jesus Christ. So understand that you must be deputized, you must be authorized by Jesus Christ. Let me say this to you. There are many people that we have encountered that have been illegitimately functioning in spiritual authority. They have been illegitimately claiming that they have spiritual authority because they think that because their title is apostle or prophet or evangelist or pastor or teacher that it automatically means that they have spiritual authority or that they can operate in spiritual authority. And some of them have had us deceived, the very elect deceived into thinking that their charisma, can I tell you something, people of God, charisma is not spiritual authority. Talent is not spiritual authority. Just because a person prays loud and long, that is not spiritual authority. Just because a person runs around the church and speaks in tongues from A to Z, from Monday to Sunday, it does not mean that they have spiritual authority. The only way that you can function in legitimate spiritual authority is when you are functioning under the Lordship of Jesus Christ who has authorized and deputized you to function. A title does not mean an individual possesses spiritual authority, nor does it authorize you to operate in the spirit. Well, you say, well, pastor, give me some Bible for that. Well, let's go to Acts chapter 19. You don't have to just write it down, write it down. Acts chapter 19, I'm going to paraphrase because I've got a lot of scriptures for you tonight. But go to Acts chapter 19 and you will read about the seven sons of Sceva. You will read that the Bible declares that the apostle Paul wrought forth many works and many miracles uh, through the laying on of hands because because he was filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible said that the Apostle Paul, he laid hands on the disciples, those that were following him, and they were immediately filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, the seven sons of Sceva, one of them particularly was a son of one of the chief priests, and they felt that because they saw Paul operating in this level of power, that they too could function in this level of power. They saw that Paul was operating in spiritual authority. 
healing, casting out devils, and laying hands and imparting. And they said, well, hey, we can do this too. They did not realize that they were not authorized, that they were not deputized to lay hands and to operate in the spirit. Well, what does the Bible say? The Bible says in verse 16, 14 and 15 rather, and there were seven sons, one of Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priest, which did so. Verse 15 says, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Listen, the devil is not intimidated by your title. The devil is not intimidated by how many, uh, uh, how long you've been in the church of God in Christ or how long you've been in the Baptist church or how long you've been in the AME church. The devil is not intimidated by how well you sing. The devil is not intimidated by how well you, how well you mimic Juanita Bynum or how well you copy somebody else's tongues or how well you try to preach like T.D. Jakes. He is not intimidated intimidated by that. He is intimidated by spiritual authority. And so because the seven sons of Sceva were trying to operate without being divinely delegated or authorized, the Bible says in verse 16, and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This is what happens when you try to function on a level or on a dimension that you have not been authorized. This is what happens when you try to exercise spiritual authority. This is what happens when you try to cast out demons and you have no spirit on the inside of you. The devil will whip up on you and make a fool out of you. But I dare you just to type, the devil's not going to make a fool out of me because I've got spiritual authority. The devil's not going to make a fool out of me because I'm going to posture myself and position myself in this season to be endowed with power. <laughs> Glory to God for him to pour into me, for his spirit to live and dwell on the inside of me so that I can operate in spiritual authority. Now in Luke chapter 9 verse 1, the Bible declares, and Jesus called together the 12 disciples and gave them the right, power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. Now here in Luke chapter one, Jesus gives his disciples, a disciple is a follower of Christ. You are a disciple, I am a disciple. He gave them power and authority over all the power of the enemy. There are two different Greek words translated as power in the New Testament. The first word power is exousia, which means authority. The other word power is dunamis, which means strength or ability. So Jesus is conveying that there is no power of the enemy. There is no plague. There is no malady. There is no principality. There is no ruler of darkness. There is no spiritual wickedness in high places that can defeat us. Why? Because we have been given spiritual authority. We have exousia and we have dunamis. We have exousia and we have dunamis. And of ourselves, spiritual authority is non-existent without the perpetual dwelling of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual authority is non-existent without the perpetual dwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul asked the question in Acts chapter 19, verse 2. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you have believed? Without the Holy Spirit, we have no power over ourselves or the enemy. Ah, uh, see, I, I took a curveball there. Y'all weren't expecting that one. Listen, without the Holy Spirit, we have no power over ourselves or the enemy. Why? What does the Bible tell us in Galatians chapter 5? But the fruit of the Spirit. Without the Spirit, you cannot bear the fruit of the Spirit. Without the Spirit, you have no patience. You have no love. You have no joy. You have no peace. You have no long-suffering. You have no righteousness. You have no temperance. You have no meekness. You don't have any of those attributes if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. So yes, I stand by what I say, and before I take it back, I'm going to add some more to it. You have no power over yourself if you do not have the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of you. Not only do you not 
not have power over yourself, but you cannot have power over the enemy without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Because understand that it is the Holy Spirit that is the force within us that enables us and empowers us to exercise spiritual authority in every area of our lives. For the word of the Lord declares in 1 John 4 and 4 that if God be for us, who can be against us? Excuse me, 1 John 4 and 4 declares that greater is he that is within me than he that is within the world. I'm getting ahead of myself and getting so excited. Hallelujah. But hey, same relevance, same context, glory to God, and, and, and we can hold fast to either of those words. But we have spiritual authority over every area and every aspect of our lives because we have the great I am dwelling on the inside of us. We have El Shaddai dwelling on the inside of us. Know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are filled with power. And because you are filled with power, we have spiritual authority over every area and every aspect of our lives. We have spiritual authority over church hurt. Oh my goodness. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. It is not the church that hurt us, not the physical church that hurt us, but it's the people within the church that hurt us. We have to take spiritual authority even over church hurt. Misunderstanding understandings, conflict, rejection, betrayal. You told somebody something in confidence and they went and told sister so-and-so and she told brother so-and-so and now you found out more than one person knows what you told them and so now you're done with the church. No, you've got to take spiritual authority even over hurt that you experience in the church to say, you know what, listen, for God I live and for God I die. I'm not going to allow anything to run me out of the house of God. One thing that I desire of the Lord and that one thing that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord to behold his beauty and to inquire of his temple. I'm not going to allow anyone or anything to run me out of the house of God. If I got to move up to the front row so I don't get distracted, I'm going to do what I have to do. I'm going to take spiritual authority over it and not allow it to have authority over me me. We have spiritual authority over generational curses, family conflict, and there's no conflict like family conflict, people of God. There's no conflict like holiday conflict. There's no conflict like a misunderstanding. I'm going to tell you something, saints. One of the things that I really try hard not to do when it comes to having sensitive conversations is text messaging those kind of conversations because it's so hard to interpret a person's tone and a person can be completely joking a person could be having a chill day, but because we cannot interpret the tone over the text message, then we take it offensively. This could be family. This could be anybody. And so we have seen where even text messages have caused miscommunications within families. But listen, we've got to take spiritual authority over family conflict. Hey, let, hold on. I'm not texting you no more. Mom, let me talk to you. Hey, uncle, let me talk to you. Hey, cuz, I didn't mean it that way. This is taking spiritual authority because remember, in the earth, it is our responsibility to have dominion and along with that dominion to have influence in the family structure. You don't know. You may be the one that God has raised up to save your drunk uncle. You may be the one that God has raised up uh, to save your cousin who's a wonderful person who does great things, but they just need Jesus. But if you're always offending people, if you're always the one clowning people, if you're always the one talking down to people, if you're always the one denigrating people, if you're always the one who always has a complaint, your light is not shining and you cannot take authority over family conflict if you're the one causing it. Confusion, procrastination, mental capacities. The Bible tells us that we have to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We take spiritual, spiritual authority over manipulation, over pride, because these 
are all tactics and diabolical assignments of the enemy that are imposed to encroach upon our spiritual mobility, velocity, and fortitude. But Jesus said, Jesus said, this is what Jesus said. Now listen, I named all those things, and there are so many other areas that we can name where we know that the enemy tries to cause havoc and, and where he tries to impose confusion. But here's what Jesus said. Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verses 18 through 19, I'm going to read in the Amplified Version. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. My God, my God. Saints of God, can I tell you that the only way you'll be able to see the devil fall is if you're not working with him. The only way you're going to be able to see the devil defeated in your life is if you come out of agreement with him, is if you refuse to work with him. The reason why Jesus was able to see Satan fall like lightning is because they were diametrically opposed. They had no fellowship with each other. They were opposites. Oh, my God. He said, listen, I saw Satan. I watched him fall like lightning. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. He said, now listen, I've seen Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Satan has been dethroned. He has been relegated. He's not delegated. He has now been relegated, which means that he has uh, uh, been taken down from his place of promotion, from his place of hierarchy. And so Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, 19, listen carefully. I have given you that you now possess authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions, and the ability to exercise authority, exousia, over all the power. I heard it said one time, all means all. Over all the power of the enemy, Satan, and nothing will in any way harm you. Now understand that this spiritual authority that has been delegated, that has been imparted, that has been released to us is a spiritual blessing that is only given to the spirit-filled believer. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 declares, Blessed be the God, my God, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. I want you to text right now. I want you to type right now. I have all that I need through Jesus Christ. Come on. I have all that I need through Jesus Christ. I have all that I need through Jesus Christ. He supply all of my need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Come on. I have all that I need in Jesus Christ. He has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Uh, here in Ephesians chapter 1 and 3, he says, listen, I have given you all spiritual blessings. But where do those spiritual blessings come from? They come from heavenly places in Christ. With this spiritual authority, we have been given a seat of authority. We are joint heirs with Christ, and we have been called to rule and to subjugate with Jesus Christ. Now, in the heavenlies, the Bible declares that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. The right hand is the hand of power. And so Jesus is seated on the side of power. Now, if we as the people of the Most High God are joint heirs, if we are fitly joined together with Jesus Christ, that means that we are seated in the same side of God that he is seated on, which is the side of power. And so although we are physically located in the earth, we are spiritually located in the heavens. You understand what I'm saying? Although we are uh, physically located here in the earth, we are spiritually located in the heavens. Because if you died with Christ, you were raised with Christ, and you are now seated with Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 says, And God raised us up with Christ. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And so, and so, here it is. Where you are seated, wherever your location is, it determines what your response to crisis will be. Now, when this pandemic first broke out, take yourself back and ask yourself, what was my initial reaction? What was my initial response? 
Because whatever your initial reaction, whatever your initial response, it speaks to where you were located. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So if you were spiritually located in the heavens, your reaction was faith, your reaction was hope, your reaction was peace, your reaction was, okay, God, okay, God, God's going to have to do this. God's going to fix this. Now, listen, I'm not saying you may not have had a moment where you're like, whoa, what is going on? But saying to God, when you came back to your senses, you realized, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. My mindset, I'm thinking too low. I've got to set my affections on things above. And so, however you react to crisis, however you react to current circumstances, it speaks to where you are located. Hallelujah. So this means that during this time, if somebody types something on Facebook that you don't like and you automatically have the heart to respond or if somebody posts something that you think is about you and you automatically have the heart to respond and to go off and to do this, that lets us know, that lets you know where you're located. Where is your spiritual location? Somebody type that. Where is your spiritual location? Where is your spiritual location? If you're always offended, where is your spiritual location? If you're always fearful, where is your spiritual location? Your spiritual location should be the heavens. Because that is where your seat is in the spirit realm. And that is where we are supposed to be fighting from. But if we allow ourselves to be enthroned in this earth, Bible declares that heaven is the throne of God and earth is his footstool. See, no matter what, Satan is always under our feet. <laughs> He's always under our feet. Listen, he said that the seed of a woman will bruise the head of a serpent. If we're down here, walking around, trod around, his head is bruised down here. When we are elevated in heavenly places because he functions in that second realm, hallelujah, and we're talking about being seated in the third dimension, which is the heavens, glory to God, he's still under our feet. No matter what, no matter how you are positioned, no matter what your assignment is, you are always to ensure that Satan remains under your feet. Because your feet, they represent complete authority and subjugation. So, so here's the question. What is it going to take to perpetually walk in spiritual authority? What is it going to take to perpetually walk in spiritual authority? Now, he, he has given us this spiritual authority. Um, this is how we are supposed to operate. This is how we are supposed to function. But what is it going to take to do this perpetually? What is it going to take to operate in spiritual authority even while we are at home in this place of cultivation? What is it going to take? Well, the first thing that it's going to take, and I want you to type this out, is total submission. I'm going to wait. Somebody type it. I'm going to wait. Total submission. Come on, I need about three more of you to type it. Come on. Total submission. Robin, did you type it? Total submission. Total submission. Janet, I need you to respond. Total submission. All right? The first is total submission. James 4 and 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Uh-huh. And resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Understand that submission to God is one of the greatest threats to the enemy. Because understand that the enemy cannot do anything with someone who's submitted. Your submission to God intimidates the enemy. Why? Because he recognizes that if you are submitted, that you have become determined. And when you have become determined, oh my goodness, you, you, you walk and you live and you breathe, Philippians 4 and 13. I can do all things through Jesus Christ that strengthens me. You can't do this if you're not submitted. And so the enemy is threatened by your submission. Uh, James, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 declares, He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy 
the works of the devil. You cannot destroy the works of the devil if you are not submitted to God. You cannot resist the devil if you are not submitted to God. You cannot be a joint heir with the devil and be a joint heir with God. You have to submit to God. You have to bow your will to God. Your prayer should be, not my will, O Lord, but your will. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, when you submit to God, you're not just submitted to him when things are going well. You're not just submitted to him when you have all the money you want in the bank. You're not just submitted to him when people are complimenting you and when people are talking you up. The Bible tells us that we are going to be persecuted, that we are going to have to endure hardness as good soldiers for Jesus Christ. But no matter how much we are persecuted, the, uh, Paul said, listen, we are accounted for the sheep as for the slaughter. We are like sheep just waiting to be slaughtered every single day. No matter what you encounter, we have to remain submitted unto God. Because when we remain submitted to God, there is no power of the enemy that can overtake us. And we have the power to resist him. Number two, so number one, I hope somebody wrote this down. Number one is total submission. You can't withhold anything. You've got to give it all to him. Listen, you got to be so submitted when, when things in your life start feeling like they're falling apart. You got to be so submitted to God where you don't fall apart. When things in your life seem as though it's just like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Uh, every time I turn around, it's like, gosh, more and more trouble keeps happening. You got to make up in your mind, but I don't care what's going on in my life. I'm not going back to where God brought me from. I'm forgetting those things which are behind. And I'm pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. There's nothing for me back there. There's no marijuana good enough for me back there. There's no sex good enough for me back there. There's no alcohol uh, 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 good enough for me back there. There's nothing good enough for me to go back to, to remove myself from being submitted to Jesus Christ. Because that's where my blessings are. There's nothing for me back there. Number two is you need to know your enemy. You need to know your enemy. The Bible tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But understand that in knowing your enemy, you've got to understand that he does not have any new tricks and he does not have any new schemes. The devil knows you better than you know him. So you've got to start studying how your enemy maneuvers in your life because the devil does not tempt us all the same way. The devil does not attack us all the same way. So you've got to know, okay, what has the devil learned about me that I know I need to allow God to process me through or I need to allow God to cut off from me? Because whatever the devil has learned about me, that's the very place in which he's going to attack. So, so how does the devil move in your life? How does he maneuver? You need to know what are his cycles. You need to know what time of the year does the enemy tend to attack me the most. Is it Christmas? Is it the summertime? Is it spring break? Is it tax season? <laughs> Is it Labor Day? What time of the year does it seem like that overwhelming sense of depression? Is it your birthday? Many of you watching me today, sometimes our birthdays, which are supposed to be the happiest time of the year for us, can be very depressing. It can be very sad. It can be a time of, of just like feeling like we're not good enough. We haven't accomplished anything. Look, you're, look how old you are. You're still single. You still don't have this. You still don't have that. And so the enemy begins to speak to your mind even on your birthday when you should be celebrating life. When you should be excited that God gave you another year. You're at home in the dark, depressed. You've got to know your enemy. You've got to know how he works. And you've got to be sober and vigilant, recognizing that he is going to come after you. Uh, uh, here, be sober and vigilant, understanding that your devil, the enemy, he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So, so when does the devil seek to devour me most? You've got you to study this. You've got to know this. As soon as you receive a prophetic word, you already know what's up. As soon as you're in church and you have a high service, 
We have stairs in our church, so when you go down those stairs, you've got to be sober and vigilant and know, okay, the enemy as a roaring lion, he's going to seek to devour me. He's going to seek to eat up the word, that seed, which is the word of God that has been planted into my life. Okay, let's say at home, any manifestation of the spirit, even in your home, attracts demonic attacks. And so the devil knows he can't come in your house. So what does he do? Cause somebody to break into your car. The devil knows he can't come in your house, so what does he do? He, he causes somebody to cut you off while you're driving out of your little colder sack. Come on. you got to study the enemy so that you know that, oh, my goodness, okay, I, I, I'm not ignorant of his devices. Let's go to the scripture. I want to give you some scripture. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. It says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You've got to know your enemy so that he cannot take advantage of you during your vulnerable moments. You've got to know your enemy so that he cannot take advantage of you anymore during Christmas. So he cannot take advantage of you anymore. I'm about to get in trouble. I'm about to get in trouble. You've got to know your enemy singles so that he does not take advantage of you anymore on Valentine's Day. Oh, God. Oh, God. I don't ever get anything. I, I, listen, listen. Whether you're male or female, all of us get to that place. Feel like, man, did nobody buy me no chocolate? You ain't got me no Reese's peanut butter cup. I ain't got nothing. Man, you know, what's up? What? We cannot allow the enemy to get the advantage of us. So we will not be ignorant of his devices. So we've got to maneuver around him. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to trick him up. Because understand that yes, the enemy has some knowledge, but he's not equal to God. So he is not omniscient. He's not all-knowing. Yes, the enemy has some presence, but he's not omnipresent. He cannot be everywhere at the same time. And even though he cannot be there, he may try to see it, send some demonic forces. But because you have spiritual authority, you say, uh-uh, it's my birthday. I'm going to cry if I want to. I'm going to shout if I want to, I'm going to dance if I want to, get on up out of here. See, you got to take authority even in your house. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Because you got to understand what the enemy is attracted to. He's attracted to confusion. He's attracted to when you and your husband fuss and fight and you decide you're going to sleep on the couch and you're going to sleep in the bedroom. Oh, he's like, oh, I got, a, I got an open entry here. But when you say, you know what, this time we're going to do something different. You're not sleeping on the couch. I'm not sleeping by myself. Come on, let's, let's, get to, let's get together and let's sleep together as a married couple. Listen, when you tell your daughter off and she tells you off and you decide we're not going to talk for a few days, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to fix this right now. We're going to fix this right now. We're not going to let the sun go down on our wrath, and we're going to come to a place and reason together. The enemy has no entryway when you know how the enemy comes in and how he exaggerates the situation. Matthew chapter 16, verse 23 declares, But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. Understand that here, uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is telling his disciples, listen, that the son of man, me, I'm going to have to suffer. I'm going to have to go through some things. And Peter's like, no, 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 you don't got to go through all that. No, don't do it. Don't do it. So Jesus says, wait a minute, you are speaking against the will of God. And so now he acknowledges him as Satan, because in this moment, in this moment, Peter has become an enemy to Jesus. Listen, anything that speaks against, anything that fights against the plan and the purposes of God for your life is an enemy. And so in this moment, Peter became an enemy to Jesus. And so Jesus said, wait a minute, Satan, get thee behind me. You are an offense to me. Because you are not savoring the things. You are not focused on the things that be of God. You are not embracing, embracing those things that be of God, but those things that are of men. John 10 and 10, his assignment never changes. The enemy has a threefold assignment. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. All right? So, 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 how do we take 
Or how do we perpetually walk in authority? Number one is submission. Somebody write it down. Number one is submission. Number two is you need to know your enemy. You need to know your enemy. All right? Number three, use your weapons. Use your weapons. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. I'm going to read in the Amplified Version. The weapons of our warfare are not physical. They are not weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of forces. And the King James Version. spiritual weapons we cannot fight natural battles with spiritual weapons we cannot fight excuse me spiritual battles with natural weapons we cannot fight spiritual battles with natural weapons and so what are the weapons that he has given unto us the weapons that he has given unto us are prayer and fasting Jesus told his disciples they came to him and they said Jesus why couldn't we cast out this demonic spirit out of this little boy. And Jesus said, these kind go without only by prayer and fasting. Hallelujah. These kind go without only by prayer and fasting. So we recognize that prayer and fasting is a weapon of warfare. Glory to God. It's wonderful to pray, but if you're really trying to break through to the heavenlies, if you're really trying to break through some barriers, if you're really trying to do some destruction to the kingdom of darkness, turn that plate over. Take time to consecrate. Take time to say, you know what, I'm going to supplicate before God. I'm going to hide myself. I'm going to take some time to go into a, a private time with God. I'm going to go to my prayer closet and I'm going to uh, 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 close out all of the outside noises and all of the extrinsic activities that I'm normally a part of so that intrinsically I can be endowed with another dimension of glory. Another weapon that he's given us is we can plead the covering of the blood of Jesus. And we've read in the book of Exodus that it was instructed to the people of God that you cover the doorpost with the blood. Hallelujah. And when they see the blood, whatever they plan to do, whatever kind of death they try to bring to your doorstep, it must pass over. We have to plead the covering of the blood of Jesus because the blood of Jesus is a powerful weapon that yet has potency. The blood of Jesus yet has potency. The blood of Jesus yet flows. The blood of Jesus yet lives. The blood of Jesus yet speaks. The blood of Jesus yet has potency. And so we can plead the blood of Jesus. It, it's, it, listen, the blood of Jesus is not a historical artifact. The blood of Jesus lives today. Many have died. <laughs> but when they died, their blood died too. But the blood of Jesus still prevails today. Praise and worship. We read in 2 Chronicles that when the enemies had come against Jehoshaphat, the Bible declares that he gathered the Levitical priesthood the singers and the worshipers. And he said, come on, let's get together and let's praise God and sing. Praise God for his mercy endureth forever. And what happened? The Lord sent ambushments against those enemies because their praise and their worship was a weapon of warfare. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The name of Jesus is a weapon that we can use against the enemy. When we use the name of Jesus, when we are operating in spiritual authority, every enemy must be scattered. Demonic forces are abolished. 
my God. Healing must take place. Peace is released when we call on the name of Jesus. Many of you today can remember when you were in that car accident. Hallelujah. And yes, the accident and the impact of the accident may have totaled out your car, but it didn't total out you. Because many of you can remember calling Jesus. Many of you can remember when you were out there back in the day and there were drive-by shootings and that bullet was not designed for you, but it passed over you. It was, it was for somebody else, but it passed over you. Because when you heard the shot, the gunshot, you cried out the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is a powerful weapon that we are to use when exercising spiritual authority. And so if we're going to walk in perpetual spiritual authority, we must be totally submitted to God. We must know our enemy and we must use our weapons. Now, one of the things that we are going to have to do in this dispensation, I'm getting ready to close, is that we are going to have to exercise spiritual authority in our homes like we never have before. We're going to be spending a lot of time in our homes. We're going to be spending a lot of time with family um, and singles. We're going to be spending a lot of time with ourselves. We have to set the spiritual climate and the spiritual temperature in our homes. We have to take authority. We have to exercise spiritual authority. So this means that I'm careful of even the things I allow to come through my TV. Because whatever I allow to come through my TV is the spirit that I release in my home because I control the temperature. I have to be careful what videos I click on on Facebook. You know, people send me all kinds of videos um, in my inbox and stuff all the time. And some things I watch to be informed and some things I'll look at it and be like, okay, I'm probably not going to watch this. If I see guns and kids and all kinds of stuff, I'm probably not going to watch those things that are violent because I don't want to release that violence, that spirit into my home. I'm going to be careful in even conversations that I have because I want to control the temperature. I want to make sure that I'm not just waiting to get back to church to lay hands on people and to speak in tongues and shout and to have all the spiritual authority in here, but go home and live in hell. And so the Lord is giving us an opportunity, people of the Most High God, to set the climate in our homes. And we have the power to do so because he has given unto us Spiritual authority. Somebody type, I have spiritual authority. Come on, type it. I have spiritual authority. Come on, declare it. I have spiritual authority. I am not powerless. Come on, I'm not void of power. I have spiritual authority. Come on, I have spiritual authority. I have spiritual authority. Now, don't just type it. Don't just text it. But even while you're typing and texting, let it come from your mouth. Come on, he will establish the things that you decree. Come on, decree and declare, I have spiritual authority. I have spiritual authority. I have spiritual authority. Come on, I have spiritual authority. Hallelujah. Over all the power of the enemy. And so when I feel like my back is up against the wall, when I feel like I'm backed into a corner, oh, I, I've got some weapons I can use. I break out into prayer break out into a praise. I break out into singing. I break out into worship. I plead the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. I plead the name. I, I, I call the name of Jesus. I use my spiritual weapons in the midst of a spiritual battle. Hallelujah. Because I recognize that I have spiritual authority. And when you know you have spiritual authority, there are some things you, you do not have to take. Listen, somebody should type that. There are some things that I just don't have to take. There are some things that I do not have to take. In my home, oh, absolutely not. My home is a tabernacle. My home is a temple. My home is a church. <laughs> Come on. I, there are some things I do not have to put up with in my house. Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we thank you today. We thank you that you have given unto us dominion and that you have given unto us principles with that dominion. We talked about influence last week and today we've talked about spiritual authority. We thank you for revelation and illumination in your word. Now, Father, your word declares that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We thank you and we glorify you. 
that although the wiles of the enemy are ever so loose during these perilous times, that you have given us power. Father, you have not left us powerless, but you have given unto us a comforter. You have given unto us a paraclete. You have given unto us a guide. You have given unto us a cornerman, one who will teach us how to war in the spirit. And so, Father, we thank you and we praise you that as we operate in spiritual authority, that every soul and every spirit must be subject to the power of God. We thank you and we praise you that at the name of Jesus, that demons flee, that at the name of Jesus, everything that has exalted itself, it has to bow before you. Sickness has to bow at the name of Jesus. Terror has to bow at the name of Jesus. Fear has to bow at the name of Jesus. Poverty has to bow at the name of Jesus. Confusion has to bow at the name of Jesus. Coronavirus has to bow at the name of Jesus. We thank you for your name, that powerful name, that name that is a weapon of mass destruction. Now, Father, I pray for every individual, every saint of the Most High God that is watching this broadcast even right now. I ask that you would empower them and that you would cause them to be cognizant to know that they are not weak, but they are strong. For we are to be strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. We thank you that we are stronger than we have ever been. And even when we feel weak, we are to declare, the Bible says, let the weak say that I am strong. And so we thank you, God, that your strength is made perfect in our weakness, that you're giving us the strength to endure, the strength to persevere during this time. We will not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. We thank you for the harvest of blessings that you have in store for us. We thank you, oh God, that even during this time of uncertainty, that we are certain of one thing. We are confident in this very thing, that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so we thank you for being so good. We thank you for being gracious. We thank you for being great in our lives. This we recall to our minds. Therefore, we have hope. It is because of your mercies that we are not consumed, because your compassions fill us not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And we thank you because you've been faithful to us. Father, we are not going to complain, but we are going to give you thanks. We are going to give you the praise, for it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises to your name most high. We take spiritual authority, and for the spirit of heaviness, we put on the garment of praise. We take spiritual authority, because you give us beauty for our ashes. You give us a dance and joy, even in the midst of our mourning. We take spiritual authority, and we thank you that when the enemy tries to come in like a flood, you, the Lord God, lift up a standard against him. We thank you and we praise you right now that even as we are wrestling in the spirit, even as we are wrestling against finding out things about ourselves that we did not know before, because God, you are enlightening our eyes. You are illuminating our eyes to see ourselves in ways that we've never seen ourselves before. But we thank you, oh God, because you are transforming us. You are renewing us. You are comporting us. We are being transposed into your image and into your likeness. And we thank you, oh God, that we will never be the same. Oh yes, God, as everything around us is shifting, we are shifting. Our faith is shifting. For the word declares, but without faith it is impossible to please you. For he that cometh to you must believe that you are, and that you are a rewarder of them that diligently seek you. We thank you, God, that you've given unto us the measure of faith, that we are fully persuaded that there's nothing that can separate us from your love. We are fully persuaded that you are Emmanuel, the God who is with us. And yea, though we walk through the valleys in the shadow of death, we will fear no evil because you are with us. We are fully persuaded of your promises. We hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering. For you are he that promised. And you are faithful. As we've already declared, great is thy faithfulness. We thank you, O oh God, for being faithful to us. 
and we declare and we decree that you are going to heal this land. You've been faithful, oh God, in the midst of pandemics before. You've been faithful, oh God, in the midst of economy crashes. You have kept us. You have blessed us. You have restored us. And so, Father, we know that if you did it before, that you have the power to do it again. For you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So we trust in you with all of our hearts. And we lean not to our own understanding. In all our ways, we acknowledge you for you to direct our paths. We trust in you. Our confidence is not in the government. Our confidence is not in the law. Our confidence is in you. Our confidence is of you. Our expectation is of you. Our anticipation is of you. Our help is in the hills. So we look up. We look up. We look up. We look up to you. And we thank you, oh God, that as we look up to you, we reach up to you. When we reach up, that's our sign. That's signifying that we need your help. Father, we need your help. And while on others that are calling, do not pass America by. America needs your help. America needs mercy. America needs healing. America needs strategy. We thank you and we praise you. For you are the God who downloads wisdom. You are the God who downloads knowledge. You are the God who downloads understanding. And you have the ability to download knowledge and understanding for a vaccine. Oh God, against this coronavirus. So Father, we pray that you would release a vaccine. Release the idea. And if it's already in the earth... For those that are in the hospitals right now, if it's already in the earth, we tear down pride. We come against ego and we speak, Lord, humility to those who function. For those, God, that have the authority to say, okay, use this vaccine. Help them not to be selfish. Help them to be compassionate. Help them not to be focused on money more than they're focused on humankind. And Father, if you would do that for us, we'll be so thankful. Oh God, in between us waiting for you to evacuate and expedite an eradication of this coronavirus, we believe that you can release a vaccine. We believe that you can keep those. We believe that you can heal those with your supernatural power. We believe those that have gone and been tested, that have positive tests, they can go back and become negative because you're still a miracle worker. There's nothing too hard for you. There's there's nothing impossible for you. And so we thank you. We appeal before the God who works miracles. We appeal before the God who is the God of signs and wonders and mysteries. We appeal before the God who performs all things. El Elyon, the most high God, the God who sits high and looks low. We appeal to the God, El Roy, the God who sees all. For behold, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. We thank you, O oh God, that you see the afflictions of your people and that you hear our cry and that deliverance is on the way. For many are the afflictions of the righteous, but it is you, God, who delivers us out of them all. We thank you that deliverance is drawing nigh. We thank you that deliverance is closer than we think. We thank you that breakthrough we thank you. That weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming. The time to celebrate is coming. We thank you, oh God, that it's almost that time for us to be free from this coronavirus and from this pandemic. And we make a commitment that we're going to function responsibly, that we're not going to be all willy nilly, but we're going to practice good hygiene. Not only are we going to practice good hygiene, but we're going to take you more serious. We're going to worship you in spirit and in truth. We're going to do our best to live lives that are pleasing to you. We're going to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you, which is our reasonable service. We're going to turn from our wicked ways. We're going to walk in humility. We're going to seek your face. We thank you, oh God, that when we do this, you will heal the land. You'll hear from heaven. You'll forgive our sins. We thank you, oh God, that you are a promise keeper. We thank you.
true God. You're not a truce breaker. You're not a covenant breaker. But you are the God who keeps your covenant. Every covenant that you have established with mankind, you are the God who is faithful to keep your covenant. And although we don't have all the answers to what is happening right now, we know the God who has all the answers, and that is you. For you are omnipotent. You are omniscient. Huh, you are all-knowing. And so we seek you. For when we call upon you, you will show us great and mighty things that we do not know. And so, Father, we will continue to pray. We will continue to pray for the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much. And thank you, Lord, for hearing us today. This is the confidence that we have in you, that if we ask anything according to your will, you hear it us. And we know that if you hear us, we have the petitions that we have desired of you. Oh God, we will persist in prayer. We will cease not in prayer. No matter how long it takes for you to do it, we will continue to pray because that's what you have commanded. And prayer is our weapon of mass destruction. And so we thank you, Lord, for equipping us for such a time as this. In the name of the Lord Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen and amen. Saints of God, Pray from your heart. Pray strategically. Even as it pertains to this pandemic, tell God what you desire for him to do based on what you know about his ability. If he doesn't eradicate the coronavirus, well, he can cause a vaccine to be released to the earth. Amen. Let's continue to pray strategically and watch God move in the lives of his people. Some trust in horses. Some trust in chariots, but I will trust in the name of the Lord. And that is where our trust has to be. Our trust has to be solid. Our trust has to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know, our labor is not in vain in him. Hallelujah. God bless you. I want to invite you at this time to give. Let us sow seed into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Let us sow seed into the kingdom of God. I want you to go to GDC Tacoma, that's Cash App, and I want you to release a seed of $10. For those of you that are tithing, that are releasing your tenth of your increase, I want you to do that. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 3, to honor the Lord with our substance, so that your barns can be filled with plenty. And so now is your opportunity to honor the Lord with your substance, so that your barns can be filled with plenty. Hallelujah. And that your presses can burst out with new wine. So I want you to sow that seed of $10. For those of you that are tithing, go to GDC Tacoma and give that seed via Cash App. Go to greaterdestinytacoma.com, uh, which is our website, and click on giving, and you can give there as well your tithe or your offering. Greater Destiny Church, as you know, I love you so much and I miss you so much. And it is, it is definitely uh, week by week. A, a strange challenge for me to continue to come to the church and not to see you all here, to continue to come on Sunday morning and not to see you all here. But the Lord spoke to me very clearly about two weeks ago and I said, well, Lord, I'm just going to do something different or figure something else out. And the Lord spoke to me the same words that he spoke to Peter. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. Saints of God, can I tell you that this is the hour of the shepherd? This is the hour of the shepherd. This is the hour where God is separating the preachers in churches from the shepherds. Shepherds are assigned to feed the flock and to keep the flock together. Now, I'm not responsible for those who don't gather themselves with the flock and that don't want to be fed. It's like, you know, you go home for dinner and your dad cooks a big meal. You say, well, I don't want to eat that. I don't want to go. I'm not, I'm not responsible for that. But I'm responsible as a shepherd to ensure that there's always something prepared for you to feast on. This is why Greater Destiny, my brothers and sisters, why we have the call on Monday and Friday. This is why we're here live every Wednesday. This is why we're here live every Sunday. We're going to be doing some other things because it's my responsibility as a shepherd to keep the flock of God together. So many times we as shepherds have given up our voices and given up our stands for the apostle and the prophet. Amen. But right now, you don't need a prophet. You need a pastor. 
You need a shepherd. The Bible says, I will give you pastors after my own heart that will feed you with knowledge and with understanding. And so as pastors, it's important for any pastors that are watching, this is our hour. And of course, we work in tandem with the fivefold, but this is it's not to take away from that. But we have to be about our father's business. He said, if you love me, Ivan, feed my sheep. If you love me, prepare a word for them that they may live their lives. And that is exactly what I'm doing. And I want to encourage any other pastors that are watching, you're doing a great job. Keep on feeding the flock of God. Continue to do everything that you can to keep the people of God together. And I guarantee you that you will see God bless your life. Oh my goodness, you will see him work in ways that will just knock your socks off because God honors your sacrifice and he honors your faithfulness. Love you all so much with the love of the Lord. Father, I thank you for every individual that has sown into this fertile ground on tonight. And I thank you for increase and more than enough in the name of Jesus. I thank you that as we have sown tonight and as we have tithed tonight, that poverty is hereby abolished and prosperity is our abundant portion in the name of the Lord Jesus, who is the Christ, not by our might nor by our power, but by your spirit, says the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you here Sunday morning with me here in worship. Let's continue on in this series on kingdom dominion, the principles of kingdom dominion, influence last week, today's spiritual authority, and next week we're going to be talking about supernatural manifestation. So you do not want to miss this series. God bless you, and may God keep you. Have a wonder-filled night in Jesus' name.